like your brain is firing cleanly, firing efficiently, you're thinking clearly, that is a good feeling. And I'm all about cognitive nutrition, finding ways to improve how our brain feels and so we can just be better at what we do. But one thing that is overlooked a lot is going to be the world of minerals. Our brain is largely electrical. Okay, so when we think minerals, we think, oh, muscle cramp, or oh, I need my electrolytes when I go for a run. But we forget about the fact that our brain is this huge labyrinth of electrical freeways that we need to take care of. So I have four minerals that are super important. Some are worth supplementing with those minerals and some are more worth just getting through your diet. So we'll address all of it. Let's jump into this first one, okay? It's very, very important. And although it's basic, it probably is the most important to not become deficient in. And that is sodium, salt. So there's a study that was published in the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology. Now the study was done in rats, but it's still very intriguing because it shows us some mechanism here. Okay, what they did with these rats is they induced hyponatremia. So they induced a chronic state of sodium deficiency by basically inhibiting uh, receptors and things like that. Well, what they found with this was that they had a pretty significant reduction in their memory that had to do with like recognition memory. So that means like if I were to see an item, an object today, and you were to show that object to me tomorrow, I would remember it, okay? It's like a recall like that. Okay, well what they saw is there was a huge decline in that. So what the heck is going on? Well, first of all, we have to remember that this was in chronic hyponatremia. So it wasn't like they just became deficient in sodium for a short amount of time and this happened. But if they were deficient in sodium over a longer period of time, this started to occur. Well, it has to do with what's called long-term potentiation. Okay, now you've probably heard something like this before if you're interested in brain topics, but long-term potentiation is where we are basically creating new signals, okay? So it shows that like synapses get stronger over time. Okay, the connections between neurons. They get stronger and stronger over time. And as they get stronger, that means that we have better signal transmission that goes between neurons. So think of it as like carving or like water carving a canyon. Okay, when it first starts, it's barely gonna make a canyon, but over millions and millions and millions of years, you have the Grand Canyon, where it's easier for water to flow. Same kind of thing, like long-term potentiation. That's how, like when it comes down to creating a habit or forming a habit, you really have to work hard and think hard and make it happen and eventually it does become habit because you have that long-term potentiation making that signal work better. Well, what they found with this study was that long-term potentiation went down significantly in the CA1, 2, and 3 regions of the hippocampus, which are largely associated with memory. So there we have it. That is the potential mechanism. Now, again, that doesn't mean that you're automatically in that state because you went for a run and you sweated and lost a bunch of salt, but if this becomes a regular thing, then you have to be careful. But the other piece that's really fascinating is the glutamate piece. Okay, so glutamate is like the excitatory kind of system of our brain, right? When we have too much glutamate, our brain is in an excitatory state, an excited state. And a hyped up brain is not a happy brain. A hyped up brain is like chaotic. A fast brain is a more relaxed brain. So what happens when we're deficient in sodium is we have concentrations of glutamate that increase, okay? Now, I want you to think of glutamate as a bunch of chainsaws. So when we're trying to grow new synapses or make synapses stronger and grow new nerves, neurogenesis, we're trying to think of a tree that's trying to grow branches and you have a bunch of chainsaws that are cutting off the branches so they never get a chance to grow. So the more glutamate you have, the more chainsaws that you have. Well, how does sodium play a role with this? Okay, well now I want you to think of these things called astrocytes as vacuums. There's vacuums that are in our brain. And these vacuums normally go around and suck up the glutamate. They suck up the chainsaws. The problem is these darn vacuums run on sodium. So sodium's like the battery. So without the battery, the vacuums don't turn on. They don't suck up the glutamate. So the glutamate builds and builds and builds and builds. So you have a couple issues. You have the long-term potentiation issue, and then you have this glutamate issue to where in a shorter term, maybe you feel a little bit more foggy. You don't feel like your brain is clear. So don't skimp on the sodium, but also don't go crazy overboard on it, especially if you're hypertensive. I'm not a doctor, so I'm not here to say, hey, if you have hypertension, you should add a bunch of salt. I'm just saying you may want to keep a better eye on the salt that you do get in your diet. The next one is probably my personal favorite because I've been a big magnesium fan for a long time. 
If you're specifically thinking about your brain, you want to pay attention to what's called magnesium threonate because that is a form of magnesium that gets into the brain easier. But all forms, brands, everything aside, let's talk about how magnesium plays a role here. Remember how I mentioned that a calm brain, a relaxed brain, is a fast brain? Okay, well, magnesium sits on a receptor called the N... <clears throat> called the N-methyl-D-aspartate, okay, NMDA receptor. And what it does is this NMDA receptor, this is like a doorway that allows excitatory signals to get in. So when that door is open, then we have all kinds of excitatory influx, like glutamate coming into the brain. Well, guess what? Magnesium is like the bouncer. It sits on this doorway and it kicks the glutamate out. It says, get out of here. We don't want your kind here. You're not welcome here. Get out of here. But if we're deficient in magnesium, well, the bouncer's gone. That means anyone and everyone can get in, including the excitatory signals like excess glutamate. Well, what happens when you have a stronger glutamatergic transmission is you have more oxidative stress more reactions going on in the brain that shouldn't be going on, leading to more metabolism, oxidative metabolism, which means more oxidative stress, more free radicals, more reactive oxygen species in our brain, makes us cloudy, makes us foggy, and guess what? Can lead to cell and neuron death. So there's a short-term effect of feeling like, ugh, my brain's just not working, but a long-term effect of actually killing neurons. Well, there's a study that was published in the journal Medical Hypothesis that found that simply restoring the balance of magnesium, whether through supplementation or proper food or whatever, in this case, in the study, it was supplementation, it could have anti-anxiety and anti-depressive effects. This is fascinating, okay? Now, it's probably working upon two pathways. One, the NMDA pathway that we just talked about, but also magnesium can affect what's called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is the relationship between the hypothalamus, the adrenal glands, and how we produce cortisol and how that impacts our brain. So magnesium really is like the really star of the show here. I really think that people should be adding magnesium into their diet, and it's probably something that I would go out on a limb and say it's worth supplementing. But overall, electrolytes in general are something to be paying attention to, and they're no laughing matter, especially if you're exercising a lot and you're losing them. We don't realize that in just a little bit of sweat, how much salt we lose. Have you ever drank a cup of your own sweat? Yeah, it's not very fun. No, don't really do it, but you would see that it's the most salty thing that you've probably ever had. You lose a lot of minerals. Okay, so just be careful with that. Uh, I did put a link for a free sample pack of Element if you wanna try them out. That's the electrolyte I typically recommend. They're a sponsor on this channel. Don't get me wrong, this video, obviously, you can use whatever brands you want, you can use whatever minerals you want. I just figured, hey, it's a free sample, they're an awesome sponsor, it tastes good, and that link is down below. So if you use that link, you go to drinklmnt.com slash Thomas. Again, drinklmnt.com slash Thomas you'll get eight little sample packs, little stick packs that you can add to water, add to your water bottle. That way you can try Element out yourself, see if you like it. It's very sodium focused, 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. If you use this, it can help you with your sodium levels. You may still wanna take a magnesium supplement on the side though, simply because I'm a big fan of adding more magnesium if you focus on the brain piece. But either way, definitely check them out. Get the free sample pack. You just pay shipping, so a few bucks for shipping. So that link is down below, and a big thank you to them for the support. Now we get into the crazy stuff. Okay, break out the crawdads and break out the shellfish because we want zinc, all right? Zinc is one that is underrated. Okay, now you don't wanna overdo the zinc. Now, I do think that zinc supplementation comes into play, maybe like a 25 milligram zinc supplementation, but I would much prefer we get zinc from Brazil nuts, we get it from pumpkin seeds, we get it from shellfish, we get it from uh, you know, things like that, scallops, things like that are gonna be very beneficial when it comes to zinc. Zinc works a couple different ways. Okay, for one, it acts similarly to magnesium. It binds that NMDA receptor and it's an additional bouncer. It helps magnesium out by kicking out the glutamate. But it's also responsible for DNA binding that has to do with transcription factors in the brain. So that means like changes and positive changes in the brain that require gene expression. We need to have this DNA binding occur. And without zinc, that DNA binding is, well, pretty much impossible. There's an interesting study that once again looked at rodents, it looked at rats, and it found that when they put them on a diet to ultimately induce a zinc deficiency, there is a 50% reduction in the proliferation of neuronal precursors. So that means that the precursors that allow us to like build neurons and go through neurogenesis and rebuild things, there was a 50% reduction in the precursors to that. 
indicating that there could be a big role with zinc in terms of just overall brain development. Now, that could be very important for kids because the brains are developing. But as we get older, different regions of our brain are still developing and going through neurogenesis. Just because brain cell growth kind of slows down doesn't mean it's not occurring in other areas. Like even little simple tasks like working on your balance and working on memory can still trigger neurogenesis and growth of new nerve cells, so it's important. Now there was a study published in the American Journal of Medical Nutrition that took a look at depression with zinc. This one was interesting because it was a six month study, took a look at Guatemalan children that were ages, uh, or grades, excuse me, one to four, okay? So pretty young kids. And what they did is they gave them either a zinc supplement or a placebo. What they found is that adding zinc into the equation didn't seem to increase serum zinc levels. Okay, so we weren't increasing zinc levels in the blood, but there was an inverse relationship between zinc, like having more zinc, and declining levels of depressive symptoms. So what that indicates is that if the person was deficient in zinc, it brought their zinc values up to normal, but seemed to have an effect on their depressive symptoms. So that doesn't mean that you could take zinc and automatically it's going to make you infinitely happier or deal with anxiety depression, but it does mean that if you're deficient, maybe bringing your levels up to baseline and homeostasis could be beneficial for that. And it was a pretty cool study. Then there was also a study published in the journal Affective Disorders, and this looked at zinc in adjunct along with a pharmaceutical like intervention. Okay, so this looked at a drug called imaproline. Okay, a pharmaceutical called imaproline that's used for antidepressive effects. And they had subjects take uh, imaproline along with 140 milligrams of zinc or placebo. Okay, they found that the zinc alongside the pharmaceutical intervention not only increased the effectiveness of the intervention, but it improved the onset of the imaproline. So it allowed that drug to do its job faster and more effectively, probably because it allowed the drug to like actually get them above and beyond and not just claw them out of a deficiency as well. So zinc's a big one. Definitely don't neglect the foods that are rich in zinc, but you don't want to over supplement it because it can counteract copper. Okay, now another very big one that you don't necessarily want to supplement, but you do want to be very aware of getting adequate amounts in through your food, especially if you're vegan, vegetarian, paying attention to that, it's going to be iron, okay? Iron is so important. So changes in our iron metabolism can actually impair the oxidative metabolism of neurons. Now, what this means is that neurons have different jobs, okay? They don't just like receive a signal. Okay, some are responsible for neurogenesis, creating new nerve cells and having a job there. Some are responsible for myelination. Some are responsible for building neurotransmitters, okay? They all have different jobs. And if you're deficient in iron, iron is going to be imperative for ATP formation. ATP is the energy currency, but without iron, we have less ATP. Without ATP, we have less fuel for these neurons to do their job. So it brings things to a screeching halt. You have neurons that just don't have the energy to do their jobs as well. Now the interesting thing is that this can happen with too much iron as well as with too little iron. Iron is a heavy chelator. We have to remember that, that iron is something that uh, if you leave a dumbbell out in the rain and it rusts, it's going to oxidate, right? So we can have an increase in oxidative damage if we have too much iron. So you don't want to go overboard on the iron. You also don't want to be under on the iron. You want to be right in the sweet spot and it's a heavily regulated system within the body. So the best way to get your iron is through your food because more often than not, people are not really as anemic as they might think they are. If you have a doctor that really knows what they're doing, they're going to look at the full picture, right? They'll look at uh, magnesium and they'll look at how magnesium affects iron and they'll look at the ferric and ferrous states of iron. They'll look at what's in its stored state versus what's in its free state. Very important things to look at. It's not as simple as I have X amount of iron, I need to add iron. It's heavily regulated in the body, okay? But it is still very important. There's a study that's published in the journal Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology that took a look at 132 kids. 69 of them had anemia, 63 of them did not, okay? And what they found is that there were slower reaction times in the kids that had lower levels of iron, okay? This is interesting, and the mechanism is proposed to be a decrease in myelination in areas that require dopamine transmission a lot. So myelination is, if you think of a freeway, okay, and that freeway has a 50 mile per hour speed limit on it, but then you all of a sudden increase myelination 
you're increasing that speed limit to say 200 miles an hour or 500 miles an hour. So things can travel down that signal much faster. Now, myelination is important in general, but when you're looking at myelination as it pertains to uh, areas of the brain that require dopamine, this is very important just for depression, for anxiety, for how we respond to things. So it's so, so, so important when we have proper myelination for nerves to do their job faster, to get that signal out there faster, okay? So you don't, again, want to supplement with it. You want to eat the foods like the spinach that's been cooked, not raw spinach, because the, sink, the, uh, excuse me, the iron in spinach is not going to really work because there's a lot of oxalates that are going to inhibit the absorption of it. So you want to wilt your spinach. Also, the occasional red meat is going to be okay. If you're vegan or vegetarian, you need to start taking some other practices into play. But getting iron in through the diet is not as hard as people think. You only need a little bit of red meat per week to really get that job done. And there's other ways to go about it as well, even through the vegetable route. So as always, please keep it locked in here on my channel. And I hope that you can implement these minerals in different ways. And I'd say magnesium is the one that you can probably get away with adding the most of to really elicit that effect on your brain. I'll see you tomorrow.